Hello and welcome to the sixth lecture. Here I will discuss how to prepare CV, Statement of Purpose, uh, letters of recommendation, drafts, and how to email uh, the professors. Uh, there are several documents that students have to prepare when they uh, apply to the grad school, such as a detailed CV, a statement of purpose to justify uh, their reasoning uh, of, on why they're applying to that particular school. And uh, they have to uh, generally uh, provide several letters of recommendation for which the faculties sometime uh, ask them to uh, prepare the draft. And, uh, and also uh, they have to send a lot of emails to the professors uh, expressing their interest for research with them. So I will uh, discuss on all of them and uh, how to avoid the pitfalls uh, relating, to, relating to them. The first uh, slide is about the common mistakes associated with these documents. Uh, a lot of uh, the students, prospective grad students, uh, tend to look for so many templates and formatted things and uh, prepared things uh, for them instead of writing them uh, on their own. Uh, that's why they uh, sometimes they download and copy uh, pre-formatted documents, which is a wrong approach to my opinion. And also when they communicate with professors or write an SOP, sometimes they're awfully long, they exceed uh, the attention span of the professor, or sometimes they exceed the uh, uh, permitted uh, character length or, uh, or word limit. And in a lot of cases, especially in case of CVs and resumes, uh, those are flooded with, uh, with irrelevant information because they uh, want to include everything they have achieved so far, which is also a very a wrong approach and uh, create uh, and creates a very uh, negative impression. And uh, whenever they communicate, sometimes their uh, tone of language and the uh, uh, selection of words, uh, they gave a uh, negative imp impression because sometimes uh, they become informal or sometimes uh, begging for finding, funding kind of things. And also sometimes, uh, in, uh, especially in CVs, resumes, and SOPs, and also in the drafts for the uh, letter of recommendations, they're uh, flooded with errors like typos, grammatical mistakes, and that sort of things. And these common mistakes are always to be avoided in these kind of documents. So let's uh, come to writing CV first. You should always, uh, provide your updated contact information. For example, your phone number, address, email, uh, a link to your LinkedIn, and if applicable, a portfolio of your projects and achievements, uh, relevant achievements. And at the top of your CV, there should be a bullet point, four to five line summary of your achievements that is relevant to the position that you are applying for. Of course, you have to uh, mention your education and uh, your terminal degree. Uh, and relevant experience should be quantitative, not uh, focused on the responsibilities, uh, like uh, which position uh, did you hold. Uh, rather, it should be uh, on. Uh, ra rather, it should be focused on your achievements. What did you do? You should uh, come up with figures and numbers, and what. Uh, specific contributions you have made uh, for your employers. And when, when it comes to skills, you should always uh, list the technical uh, skills and soft skills, uh, because in some positions, both are needed. Uh, sometimes we just mention the uh, uh, software skills, but not the leadership skills and management skills. But in some positions, both are needed. And uh, generally in academic positions, the publications uh, are a plus. And if there are relevant awards that you have got, you should, all, uh, you should always mention those. Others are uh, uh, generally uh, voluntary experiences or reviewing experiences. For example, you have uh, reviewed a journal or you have served as a 
judge or reviewer uh, in a in a symposium, something like that. And uh, when you mention uh, some references, always take permission from those uh, people before you put their names uh, on your CV. And uh, in a lot of industrial positions, CV is kind of a detailed document. Rather, they generally expect a very concise CV, uh, concise resume, which should not exceed one or two pages. And again, you should be strictly quantitative. Uh, you should not be uh, listing just some responsibilities. Rather, you should highlight your achievements quantitatively. What uh, what did you uh, quantitatively contribute uh, for for your uh, for your current and past employers? Uh, for example, you should come up with figures and numbers and percentages. What not to do in CVs? Uh, generally, in in some cases, uh, we can see that uh, as we have little amount of achievements, we tend to fill up the pages. Uh, with personal information like uh, even sometimes we put uh, blood groups height weight and th those kind of irrelevant information personal information uh, and also marital status that sort of things uh, we should always avoid these and in summary and objectives we should be very precise concise and quantitative and uh, sometimes uh, you can also generate a very uh, polished profile from your LinkedIn uh, account and therefore you should not be too casual in your LinkedIn profile there is a there is a summary section where you can provide your overview uh, or a summary of, of your achievements and you should write in a very formal and uh, specific uh, tone there and also uh, typos are glaring uh, the, this sound uh, this may sound very simple but uh, even very professional and accomplished uh, people, uh, they, uh, their profiles may sometimes uh, be flooded with typos. And uh, when we write a CV, we try to accumulate all the information and all the achievements that we have got so far to fill up the pages and make it a very uh, fat, healthy uh, kind of CV uh, with tons of pages. Uh, you should not do that. You should always submit as many pages as needed and relevant for a particular position. And also, uh, you should not pass months with just one CV, because if you uh, go on uh, for months without revising, uh, you may avoid certain uh, very obvious uh, errors and mistakes in your CVs that you may not recognize. So you should uh, intermittently revise them. You should regularly uh, update them with information, uh, add information and polish them over and over again so that uh, one CV, one, uh, one version of your CV is better than uh, the previous one. Uh, now come to uh, writing SOP. Uh, for writing SOP or statement of purpose, a four paragraph format is ideal. You should always start with the with a strong introduction um, and an academic statement like where you're applying and with what credential. Um, and um, you should very uh, concisely uh, mention what research expertise you have for this particular position. And in the second paragraph, there should be a, a list of your courses and expertise that are aligned with the research position that you're applying for. And a third paragraph should be quantitatively describe the most important achievements that you have got from your research. And at last, you should finish very strongly uh, why you are selecting this particular university or this particular program. And what not to do in SOP, a very uh, overrated and widely used opening for an SOP is that is something like that. Uh, I have been uh, dreaming to join the school since I was five, or uh, since I have uh, since I was a kid, uh, I have always uh, I have always wanted to be a scientist, something like that. And these are the most uh, these are the weakest openings for SOPs. 
you should avoid these uh, emotional statements and cliches. Rather, you should stick to uh, research-focused statements and sentences. And also, sometimes we present our achievements negatively, like uh, we have struggled a lot, our publication uh, went through so many revisions, I have uh, studied for 16 to 18 hours a day. This may sound uh, very enthusiastic and positive, but these are actually negative statements. Rather, you should present your achievements very, pos very positively, like uh, how you have managed to finish a project within a short time span and uh, how you have handled challenges. These kind of statements should be made uh, very positively. And uh, a lot of the times when we uh, get caught up with writing the, uh, the statements regarding our research and describing our research projects, we exceed word limits and character limits. We should never do that. And the last thing is that we should never mix up a statement of purpose with a personal history statement. The, a personal history statement uh, may consist of uh, your struggles and hurdles of how you have uh, handled so many challenges in your way, but statement of purpose is uh, strictly an academic document. You are just justifying how you are capable of handling the research projects and uh, how you are fit to this, uh, to this particular program in this institution. So you should always recognize the differences between an SOP and the personal history statement. For letter of recommendations, these are obtained from the faculties. And a lot of the times the faculties are very busy and they ask, uh, and they ask the student to write, the, write a draft letter, which they edit and finally submit to the school. And uh, when writing a draft on behalf of the faculty, you should always try to focus on two points. One is a general point, like how does the professor know me? Uh, if he or she is your uh, thesis supervisor, you should focus on writing on your thesis. If he or she is your uh, academic advisor, you should focus on writing how he or she has advised you and how he or she knows you. If uh, he or she is a specific course teacher, you should focus on your performance on that specific course, that sort of things. And also, when you write uh, drafts for letter of recommendation uh, for more than one faculties, sometimes we become lazy and we tend to write the same things for uh, different letters, which is a mistake. So we should always uh, try to focus on uh, how the professor knows me and how his or her technical ability justifies my case. And that's how uh, we should separately modify and polish and prepare the documents separately. And uh, a lot of the times when students uh, write the LOR um, draft on behalf of the faculty, they become really emotional and uh, make the document full of exaggerations like this student is capable of getting a Nobel Prize or uh, he or she is capable of being uh, Forbes 30 under 30, that sort of things. We should avoid this kind of leashes and also uh, we should avoid same kind of content and style in different LORs. Different LORs should be customized differently according to the faculty and relationship to the student. And last but not the least, uh, prospective students have to write a lot of emails to the professors. And uh, there are some mistakes that they, uh, uh, that they make in the emails. Uh, the first thing is that uh, the first mistake, the most common mistake is that they tend to write a very long email. Uh, it should be avoided at all costs because professors are busy and they do not have the time to scroll through a very long email. Rather, the students should cut to the chase and get to the point at, from the very beginning of the email. And also, they should always avoid emotion. They should not beg for funding or something like that. And uh, the most eye-catching part of an email to a professor from a prospective graduate student could be your relevance and fit 
uh, in terms of his or her research. And also you should not write down your CV in the email, uh, focusing on all the achievements that you have got uh, from your academic career. Or rather you should uh, focus on uh, showing the relevance in terms of research. And generally, uh, the discussion does not end just in one email, rather uh, in a lot of times it, uh, it is rather the first email actually invokes a discussion uh, regarding funding, uh, research, teaching assistantship positions. Sometimes they ask for a preliminary interview uh, like Skype or Zoom interviews. Sometimes the professors uh, ask for a writing sample like a publication or a project. Sometimes they also ask for uh, writing a preliminary proposal, uh, which is in alignment of that professor's uh, uh, research activities. And uh, we should uh, keep some points in mind, uh, such as being formal in terms of language and tone. And we should always recognize the time zone, the difference of time, uh, of time zone, and the email should reach uh, at a convenient time. Uh, for example, uh, at the beginning of the daytime, not at the very uh, late hour at night. And also uh, the communication should be uh, very professional uh, in, uh, in terms of reasonable interval. If you email the professor and you don't get a response immediately, you should wait for a reasonable amount of time for like a week uh, before you ask for, ask for uh, a feedback or a follow-up email or send a follow-up email. And uh, it's a very big challenge to find out the professors to whom we should uh, send our emails. Uh, there are several ways to find the active professors. One way is to uh, explore the lab website where the uh, particular grants and research activities are listed. You should go through the recent publications to find out whether the professor is active. And uh, more importantly, sometimes they specifically mention uh, the grant numbers uh, and the funders. Uh, for example, if a professor has got a recent grant from NSF or NIH, that should be mentioned in the uh, uh, that should be mentioned in the website. And it's a very useful piece of information from which you can uh, actually know whether that professor is uh, recently active in research or not. And also you should explore the PhD group uh, to get an idea what kind of students uh, he or she takes and uh, how uh, he or she manages uh, that group uh, in terms of research activities. And you should get an idea uh, of the common expertise or areas of expertise uh, that the PhD group has and uh, also, uh, sometimes the professors tend to send very concise responses. You should understand the tone of responses, a generic response and a specific response or, and a negative response. All these are different and you should recognize the differences between them. And uh, as I have mentioned earlier, that a gradual communication is good instead of uh, trying to get a definite answer from the very first email. Uh, you should try to uh, make a gradual communication uh, with the professor that can lead uh, to somewhere from a preliminary interview to writing a preliminary proposal to a final funding offer. So that's what I had to uh, share about writing SOPs, LORs, CVs, resumes, and uh, emailing to the professors. Thanks.